You may know that I'm a big, huge New York football Giants fan. And it all began in 1986. I'm dating myself here. I was in fourth grade, and my dad took me to my very first Giants game. I remember they beat the Eagles 35-3 to that day and went on to win the Super Bowl, the first of four Super Bowls that during my lifetime I've gotten to enjoy as a Giants fan. But on the other hand, the past 10 years or so, they've been pretty much the worst team in the NFL, maybe along with the Jets. So I'll apologize to Jets fan. <laughs> but anyway, you know, being a fan, being a huge fan comes with great fellowship and great joy in many ways, but also there's the times of anger and suffering and complaint and all that. And I was just reflecting on fandom with regard to true happiness and true joy. Where does that come from? Well, that's what we'll look at today. This is now the third week of Advent, the third week of our series called Angels. Well, this has been a very popular topic to reflect on. I've said as angels are believed by so many different people who are in different religions, even people who are not religious, and they can mean many things to many people, from the sublime to the ridiculous, from the sec sec secular to the sacred. They can be cute and cuddly things. They could be majestic, mysterious, new agey. And that means that for some folks, it just doesn't mean anything. Angels are just a kind of charming myth. But it turns out that angel appearances are all over the scripture, from Genesis to Revelation. There are over 300 of them, including in the Christmas story. If you read Matthew chapter 1 and 2 and Luke chapter 1 and 2, they play a very important role in the story of Christmas, our Savior's birth. It began with the angel Gabriel, as we've said, coming to Zechariah, the husband of Elizabeth, the cousin of Mary, and Gabriel announced to them, that they who longed and were desperate to have a son would give birth to a son they would name John. John the Baptist. He who prepares the way for the Messiah. And then Gabriel came to Mary, the Blessed Mother, to ask her cooperation in the coming of Jesus. Then the angel came to Joseph. Then finally, on that, first Christmas nights to the sh that first Christmas night to the shepherds who were tending their flocks by night in the fields outside of Bethlehem. Luke tells us about them. The angel of the Lord appeared to the shepherds, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were struck with great fear. The angel said to them, do not be afraid. So angels are depicted as fierce and powerful, and the shepherds here are struck with great fear. It hurts them. Well, that is a common description of angel appearances. It fills people with absolute terror and fright. But the fright is not so much danger, it's distance. That glimpse we get only so briefly through these angel appearances reminds us of the great gap between heaven and earth, the great distance between God's ways and our ways. But I've said that's not the end of the story because the God of angel armies who commands these fierce and powerful creatures also sends them before us to guard us and protect us in our ways, to give us comfort and to give us purpose in our life. So angels can play a role in us getting to know God better. Angels remind us that God has not abandoned us. God is constantly intervening in our life. That's probably the first and foremost reason for us to believe in angels. We've also spoken about the service angels give and tried to clear up some misconceptions about angels. Last week I spoke about angels who send comfort for the afflicted, angels who prepare the way for God to work in people's lives, removing obstacles, and how angels as well reveal God's glory. And I spoke about guarding angels. Perhaps if you're skeptical about this topic, the idea of guardian angels is how to really make it personal. Because we believe that each of us has a guardian angel. And we can ask for their prayers and intercession. We can ask them questions. 
We can ask them to help us if we're struggling with prayer. And we can imitate our guardian angel. I said, you're no angel. People and angels are separate entities. But we can be like angels by bringing comfort to others. By preparing the way of the Lord in our hearts. Preparing for God to work. And by being a light for others. Pointing others to Christ. So, today, as I said at the beginning of Mass, is Gaudete Sunday. And Gaudete is a Latin word which means rejoice. Today is about joy. And joy is such an important topic for followers of Christ that I'm going to do an entire series about it in the new year. In the month of January, we're going to call that Joy Factor. We're going to look at how we can more and more live as people of joy. And so all appropriately, St. Paul says today to the Thessalonians this. He commands them, rejoice always. Rejoice always, really? Rejoice when you're stuck in traffic on Route 80? Rejoice when you're trying to get your kids out the door and they're driving you absolutely nuts? Don't do that, kids. (laughs) Rejoice when you're so stressed out and overwhelmed at work. Rejoice always when you're getting behind with school and you just don't know how you're going to catch up. Rejoice always seems challenging. Actually, it's not challenging. It's impossible if we seek our joy from our circumstances. You see, whenever the scripture talks about the idea of joy, it's something that's beyond our circumstances. It's something that's deeper than our feelings. Because the joy of the Lord is a gift of the Holy Spirit. The joy of the Lord is something that we don't cultivate by all of those external things, our circumstances. There are many things, you think about it, that take away our joy. It could be stress, anger, pride, self-centeredness, worry, fear. And the antidote to all those things is prayer. Now, how can we really grow to start to establish that joy of the Spirit in our hearts? Well, see, St. Paul is getting to something more permanent than our circumstances. He says, then, pray without ceasing. And that's also something we really can't do. It's impossible. Even monks and nuns who live in convents and cloisters and monasteries their whole life, they don't pray all the time. They also work. They also eat. They also sleep. But Paul is getting to something even more than this. As important as prayer is, notice what he says next. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. In all circumstances, give thanks. For this is the will of God for you in Christ Jesus. And there's the simple key to beginning to cultivate joy in your life, to seek out to give thanks, even in difficult circumstances. And one way we can think about how to do this is through the idea of worship. Just think about this. What do you tend to devote most of your time to? What do you tend to dedicate your energy, your abilities, your passion to? Where do you Place your money in. Where do you tend to find purpose and meaning in your life? Where are you giving your entire life to? And you may not say that you worship certain things, but many people do worship things that are not God. They worship power or money or pleasure or their kids or their kids' sports or their ideas or ideology or Many, many other things that are circumstantial. You see, it's not a question of if we'll worship. It's a question of who and what we'll worship. Because we are designed to worship. And so that's the thing about our circumstances. Examining them, and it may may be funny for me to say, I worship the New York Giants. (laughs) Because guess what? That's going to be disappointing. That might be really great one week and really terrible the next week. Anything that we quote unquote worship that is not God is elusive. And on the other hand, authentic worship 
is always directed toward God. And here's a mark of spiritual maturity. When even in difficult circumstances, we can give thanks to God. We can start to cultivate that heart of thanksgiving, even if we have had past hurts, past sickness, past difficulties, thanks be to God, because it's led us here to this moment today. It might sound silly. I could say, thanks be to God for the Giants losing today, because maybe I'm learning some humility or something like that. And so this is a mark of spiritual maturity to, to more and more in our, the course of our life have a heart of worship-filled thanksgiving to God, and that's the basis for cultivating joy. And it turns out, this is where the angels come in, because this is what they do. Angels, perfectly for all time and eternity, are worshiping the heavenly throne. Their efforts and their focus are directed in perfect praise and thanksgiving to God. So just think about this, the prayers that we say in Mass, before, one of the, the, before the most sacred and solemn moment of Mass, we pray the words of the angels, worshiping God as envisioned by Isaiah. At one point in the, the book of the prophet Isaiah, he has a vision of the heavenly throne at a great distance. And here's what he says, I saw the Lord seated on a high lofty throne with a train of his garment filling the temple. Seraphim were stationed above. The seraphim are the highest of the choirs of angels, the highest rank. One cried to the other, holy, holy, holy of the Lord of hosts. All the earth is filled with his glory. So when we gather together here and worship our heavenly father in mass, we are not just repeating the words of the angels, we are participating in that eternal heavenly worship. And then fast forward again to that first Christmas night in the fields of Bethlehem. We are worshiping too with the same words of the heavenly hosts who praise God with the birth of the newborn king. Glory to God in the highest. And on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. How amazing, how awesome it is when we gather here, we are praising God our Father in the name of Jesus, gathering and connecting with that perfect thanksgiving and praise of the angels. And this is where the importance of the liturgy, the Mass is, because we can learn over time to give that perfect praise to God in our hearts, in our habits, in our prayer, in all that we say and do. It's really a lifestyle. I've heard it said that the fallen angels, those who for one time, for all eternity, chose not to worship God, they actually chose to do so because they foresaw the birth of the Messiah, of the Word becoming flesh, of God coming into our world. And so they eternally choose not to worship God. And just as an aside, I point out this is why Anything that's trying to manipulate God is dangerous. Things like divination, things like, um, things, things like uh, new age or channeling or mediums or all these kind of things. That's idolatry. And on the other hand, here the good angels, they are perfectly worshiping God. Perfectly, always and eternally, eternally giving thanks and praise. And so we gather here we say the Eucharist is the source and summit of our life. Here we encounter the source, Jesus Christ our Savior, who humbly comes to us as food. Here we experience, if only briefly, the summit of our life, that eternal worship of God in heaven, our Father with all the angels and saints. Here we are fed by Christ to become like him. See who you are. Become who you receive. And then we go out to be Christ in our life, in the world. The Eucharist, which means thanksgiving, by the way, the very word Eucharist, can become the foundation stone for us to learn how to be people of thanksgiving and praise. If thanksgiving is the most important way that we can pray every single day, the Eucharist is this great mystery here 
is the most perfect uh, expression of thanksgiving. And so take the Eucharist and tie that to our daily prayer life. Our daily prayer we, where we try to daily give thanks to God. And then when we're able to spend time in front of Jesus in the, in the tabernacle or in the blessed sacrament here in our chapel. When you're able to come into a church that we're, we're celebrating as a church this year, Eucharistic Revival. And that just sim simply means entering more deeply into this great mystery of God's love for us. To be people more and more and more of thanksgiving and praise. Oh, we hear in the gospel today about John the Baptist. John the Baptist came to testify to the light. He was not the light, but he came to testify to the light. That's what angels do. That's what followers of Christ do. We humbly learn to testify to the light. And no matter what you have going on in your life, no matter your circumstances, we can grow to be thankful. That's the root of being joyful people, of having that deep, heartfelt joy of the Lord. And so my challenge this week for you, I know it's the, one of the busiest times of year for all of us, for families. Try to carve out five or six extra minutes each day this week. And just pray for that grace of being thankful in all circumstances. Just pray for that grace, for the Lord God to help you to experience more deeply that joy. Then appreciate as well the gift that happens here. Enter your heart more deeply and to worship here in the Eucharist. That God may feed us and nourish us and form us more and more into where God desires for us to be. Well, bottom line, my friends, God can give us that spirit of joy, that deep rooted joy. Let's be our better angels by developing more and more a heart of grateful worship. Amen.